this now. We post these webinars um, after the fact so that you can access them. So thank you for continuing to participate. And I would like to re-welcome you to developing and assessing intercultural competence with me, April. I'm a senior lecturer in French and Italian here at OSU. Janice. Hi, Janice Askey. I'm a professor in French and Italian, specializing in uh, historical Italian and Romance linguistics and world language uh, pedagogy. And I am Cindy Jang, a senior research associate in the Office of International Affairs here at Ohio State University. Okay. All right, we want to first of all, thank all the uh, generous funding we received from various departments across the university. Um, you know, Drake Institute for Teaching and Learning gave us our, um, generous um, support through research grants, as well as Office of, you know, Student Academic Success and International Affairs and a number of other language departments. And our research was a truly you know, collaborative you know, um, team effort, uh, starting with our research team, uh, remarkable, talented research assistants, as well as undergraduate students who helped us coding and sifting through all the data. We also wanna thank advisors at the Drake Institute who, who helped us, you know, guided us throughout the process. And the true heroes in this project are really the Italian instructors and the students in all three you know, language courses who really gave us the consent and access to their learning material as well as you know, um, share time with us and share their experience with us. So we want to acknowledge that. Okay, so everybody. <laughs> Classic, right? There's got to be at least once it has to happen, right? Um, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind you that we had a fall series of webinars where we talked about what intercultural competence is and why it's essential to incorporate explicit teaching of intercultural competence into language courses starting from the elementary level. We also described the methods we use for creating effective intercultural competence activities and gave you lots of examples from all levels of Italian um, because this was a, this this whole webinar series is a collaborative effort with uh, our colleagues at Purdue, um, and so I encourage you to um, take that link and have a look at the work that's already be, has been done. Our spring series is two webinars. This is the first, and the next is on Tuesday, April thirteenth, and the title of that is assessment of slash as intercultural learning in world language classrooms. And that will be by Tatiana Babich Williams and Aletha Stahl at Purdue. And um, um, Tatiana is gonna put a link in the chat to make sure that you all have access to that webinar. So mark your calendars. Um, slide please, April. So before we jump into this spring series, however, I'm gonna still make you wait. Um, I'd like to remind everyone why we're doing this work. Um, we're all aware of the changing landscape as well as the threat of falling world language enrollments, which is not only because of budget cuts, but it's also due to the fact that the larger community believes that the major benefit of world language study is learning to speak another language. Whereas this is indeed a benefit, we argue that it is only one among many. And unfortunately, these other benefits are not being communicated. So we need to start rethinking our curricula and teaching pedagogies, as well as how we communicate the, the value of world language study to our students. The focus of this webinar series has been, of course, intercultural competence, which is defined here and is a deliverable of world language instruction if intercultural training is incorporated explicitly into language courses. Today, we're gonna to demonstrate that this really is the case. We have recently concluded a longitudinal study on the effectiveness of a series of intercultural competence interventions in our three semester elementary Italian language sequence and we're gonna talk about this work more broadly, giving more of a bird's eye view, uh, but narrowing in on assessment. So we will begin by talking about, next slide please. 
how intercultural competence interventions were incorporated into our three semester Italian language sequence, what the discussions and the post-intervention reflections looked like, and how students were tested or assessed on, on their work. Then April, speaking from firsthand experience, will talk about how she and other instructors responded to reflections and how instructor training on inclusive teaching helps instructors manage these delicate interactions. Finally, Cindy is gonna give you a, a detailed report on the data we collected during our two-year study of the effectiveness of these interventions on the development of intercultural competence among the undergraduates in the language sequence. So slide, please. I'm gonna begin by presenting the incorporation of intercultural, intercultural experiential learning into our three semester language sequence. So we obviously don't have time to talk about each, each assignment or activity in detail. And for that, I refer, to, refer you to the second and third webinars in the fall series, but I'd like to present the main points of our approach. So as you see in first and second semester Italian, we began each course talking about the definition of intercultural competence and the importance of studying a new language. In our view, it's essential that this work is completely conscious, meaning that students understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. There is a variety of types of activities. One intervention type involved the discussion of definitions and broader, broader um, questions as we just saw for 101 and 102. But another intervention is connected with talk abroad in which our students answer certain types of questions that they then pose to their talk abroad partner. This is followed by in-class discussion and private reflection. And the last activity type is very short. Students are shown an image of a cultural concept, issue or product that is expected to strike them as strange or out of the ordinary. And then we deconstruct it and analyze it together. Another feature of this program is the emphasis on personal reflection. And you can see it in red throughout, which is the driving force of transformative learning according to Crane and Sosulski 2020. We included a final reflection assignment at the end of uh, the third semester of 103 and that asks, we asked them about inter the intercultural competence interventions in previous courses. We asked students to reflect on their personal progress with intercultural development, intercultural competence development. And we asked them how they see this work in intercultural competence, modifying how they interact with people of diverse backgrounds and how this will help them in the future. Uh, slide, please. So getting the most engagement possible from students' private reflections is tricky, particularly since we chose to grade their responses on meeting the word limit and demonstrating that they put thought into their answers. So one solution was to tell students exactly what we wanted and be clear about the, how they couldn't avoid giving a substantive response. And the fact that we kind of upped our word limit, it, it was pushing students to write more. So we found that we were able to get um, interesting responses uh, using this method. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, in order for this work to come full circle, we included intercultural competence questions on the final exam in every course. And in 101 and 102, we asked for definitions, but also concrete examples of students' experiences. And here is an example from um, Italian 101. Where And then, so you can see in blue how many times I'm, kind of, I'm asking them to give us an example so that we can see if they're, what they're learning in the course is being trans, transmitted into, into their understanding of what's going on and into their own behaviors. Um, in 103, we asked students again to talk about their development of intercultural competence and how their perceptions, judgments, and reactions to different cultures have changed over the three course sequence. So I'll, I'll pass the baton to April now, who's going to talk to you about what it's like to respond to these reflections. So hi again, everyone. I'm going to jump in, um, and in the interest of time, I know that we we all come to this place from different experiences, and 
I want to just highlight five tasks that have helped our instructors respond effectively and meaningfully to student reflections. Some of these may be familiar to you, some of them you haven't started using yet or reflecting upon. But firstly, right, we focus in on one to two subtopics of a reflection. I identify an area, maximum two, in which students can think further, specifically getting at process questions of why and how. It's really important to recognize that we don't need to respond to everything all the time, right? This is an opportunity for students to think through their own experiences, not one in which we need to pair it back to them in academic language where they are in a certain process, right? We are in a support role in this way. It's our job to ask the right questions in a way that demonstrates acceptance and our own curiosity towards their experiences and where they're going. So I'd like to reiterate that we do not want to judge where students are in their intercultural competence journeys. Um, this is really about asking the right questions so that students think more, right, and more profoundly about how they will engage in the future. We do this by poking around, right, at the assertions and the attitudes that uh, come across in the reflections with questions. Um, and I have a few simple ones, just so everyone knows what I'm talking about. We're talking about saying, inviting students to say more, or can you elaborate on this? Because I think I understand what you're saying, but maybe, right? And I'm curious why you say that, that or what do you think led to this? How did you get here? And sometimes simply, what, do you, what did you mean, right? Um, but two more points here is that um, it's important I've found that, um, you know, it's important to say, thank you for sharing these experiences. I'm so intrigued. Thank you. And when appropriate, what an awesome experience or what a difficult experience, right? Um, students are making choices when they make a choice to share with us and what they choose to share with us. And they deserve recognition and open appreciation for this. And finally, you can see how kind of budding up and new uh, up and coming new technology, audio and video feedback can be really helpful to convey nuance and tone where text can be misconstrued. It's especially useful when you're struggling to choose the correct words. Um, I give this audio and video video feedback through comments that I post to individual assignments in our learning management system. We use Canvas. Um, I think this is available to a lot of people in slightly different ways, but short comments, right? No, nope, don't give them more than three minutes to listen to. Um, but if you keep it short, you can communicate a lot of process, you know, uh, and a lot of thinking and a lot of tone and really save yourself some time. Um, I've heard a lot of conversations lately about whether this is a, saves faculty time. And um, I can throw my hat in the ring and say it does. It, it really does. Um, but I want to be direct that what can be challenging to read is well, what can be challenging is to read and respond to views that are different from our own and ones that appear underdeveloped to our eyes. Um, this is why inclusive teaching strategies and culturally responsive ways of valuing students' backgrounds and experiences are really, really important to embarking on this work. Um, again, some of these points are probably familiar to you, and so I'm just going to highlight them briefly. But we promote clarity in written prompts and the communication of expectations. In this way, we do two things. We anticipate instructor bias towards less formal writing. Uh, sincerely, some of our instructors had expectations of writing style that made some students' reflections appear empty empty experiences or shallow reflections and that wasn't the case right and but clear prompts and communication of expectations many of us know also ensures that our students dig deeper to respond critically and appropriately and secondly it's important that we recognize that some of these conversations and feedback situations can be challenging right we never ignore biases and stereotypes and sometimes this can be just, I mean, very, very difficult. I don't, I want to stress how difficult that 
how much practice it takes um, to have the confidence, right? That sometimes you freeze up because you don't wanna challenge your students or you don't wanna put people on the spot or you don't know why they said it or what they meant. Um, but this is a teachable moment. Discomfort is important and we use it to guide learning. And I'm gonna steal from Cindy. She said something recently, she phrased it really well when we were talking about stereotypes and generalizations, like, hmm, let's revisit this statement. Is that a cultural generalization or is that a stereotype? And where does that stereotype come from? It probably doesn't come from you. I bet it doesn't come from you, but where can it come from? Where did you get this? And so knowing how to address these moments without making a student defensive is hard, but this is where we can really practice interacting in a way that mirrors our values and create inclusive spaces for students. In our next round of study, because we're keeping going, but in our next round, we will be training instructors to embrace and um, facilitate student learning and the validation of student experiences and backgrounds in, even more. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Cindy, who's going to talk to you about our results. Thanks, April. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the assessment process and design and uh, how we collected data over three semesters um, in all three um, elementary uh, Italian courses. So let me start with participants. Uh, we uh, started all students enrolled in 1101 all the way through 1103. So uh, all together, we had about one of uh, 104 students. Um, the results that I'm going to talk about only includes 33 students who completed the pre and post tests and we were able to follow 33 students all the way through. The other students, as you can see, we have a significant attrition rate and also because some students participated in 1103 uh, without taking the 1101 and 1102 um, intervention courses previously. So. And as you know, I mentioned earlier, because of the generous funding we received from various you know, constituents on the campus, we were able to provide the intercultural learning modules as well as um, the assessment and everything to students um, without any uh, cost to students or any extra burden to them. So um, all of the language instruction, language instructions and uh, curriculum remained intact. And uh, this was, you know, done in a way that is really, you know, uh, feasible and reasonable to our students. So let's take a look at the student demographics. If you look at the table on the, uh, on my, on the screen, demographically, we have over 75% of the students in the study identified as a white. And this is representative of our um, campus uh, student population in general. And many of, uh, we have uh, overrepresentation of female students compared to male students. And we have more freshmen and sophomores um, in our study, which is, you know, um, reasonable because uh, 1101 generally, you know, targets um, freshmen, sophomore students. And many of our students participating in this study come from um, various areas of um, Ohio, including small towns in rural Ohio, as well as other some of the you know, uh, bigger cities. Many have, uh, have not had the, um, a lot of exposure experience or education around diversity and cultural differences. And many students in the interview uh, also share that they decided to study Italian because of their family backgrounds or history or heritage. Um, so that's probably something very typical that you hear from your students as well. So, just one sec. okay. Um, we used intercultural development inventory or um, IDI. Um, as a quantitative measure of students in a cultural competence. And um, you can see the pre and post test schedules. We really started with um, the first um, baseline test um, at the beginning of 1101, and then completed the, um, the second test at the end of 11.3. Uh, in terms of qualitative data, we also 
um, conducted interviews with 26 students at the beginning of their, um, when they are taking the 1101 um, in fall 2019. And also throughout the um, three semesters, students uh, were able to provide uh, writing assignments and final exams that had a lot of reflective questions that Janice mentioned earlier. And all of these interview and reflective data we had, um, we used ASCNU's value rubric on intercultural knowledge and global competence to assess for various levels of intercultural um, knowledge and competence. And here's a quick overview about IDI in case uh, this is something new to you and you can look at uh, look up more information on the IDI website. Um, as we mentioned uh, earlier, that intercultural competence is the ability to communicate and behave across cultural differences appropriately, effectively, and authentically. As we develop intercultural competence, we understand and appreciate the complexity surrounding diversity and cultural differences more and able to um, experience these differences in a more meaningful way. So IDI is a psychometric instrument informed by two theoretical frameworks, um, the developmental uh, model of intercultural sensitivity developed by Milton Bennett and the um, intercultural development continuum developed by Dr. Mitch Hammer. So uh, the instrument really assesses both the perceived and developmental orientations of intercultural competence. And most of our most of our students um, in the study, you know, again, freshmen and sophomores um, were in the polarization, reversal, and early minimization orientation. So polarization is an orientation that makes sense of differences from a judgmental uh, perspective, you know, uh, me versus them or our, us versus them. And uh, the, the, the reversal is really reflected in the, that most of our students are overly um, critical of their own culture and more in favor of other, you know, ways of doing things and our other ways of, you know, uh, doing things. So that was very interesting. And then um, minimization is an orientation that highlights cultural commonality and um, universal values in a way that um, could mask deeper recognition and appreciation of cultural differences. So I'm not going to go through all the different orientations, but we wanted to give you a quick, you know, um, picture of where our students uh, were when they started on this journey. All right. So it, when looking at the results, um, first we looked at, you know, the IDI gains um, and both in group and individual. So we, we did a statistical analysis to look at if the group average, you know, uh, group means are diff uh, uh, the differences are statistically significant. And next slide, please. And you can see here that students um, um, as a group on average, they gained about uh, 10, 10 points um, here as a group. And then next slide. If you look at the individual gains, you can see that the blue bars are students' um, um, baseline IDI um, scores. And the orange bar on top is the, um, the second IDI um, results. So you can see the general trend is that most of the students you know, made um, significant gains here. About um, 19 students um, out of 33 had significant growth in developmental orientation that is greater than seven points. Um, and another seven students also, you know, gained um, positive, you know, positive, made positive gains, but, you know, under seven points. We do have a few students um, sort of, you know, regressed in this um, um, developmental uh, trajectory. And um, it was very interesting to have to do this research during um, the past a couple of years, especially in the spring of 2020, um, everything happened. We, you know, um, we still continued with our study and students are still enrolled in uh, online courses. So this is something we wanted to more contextualize and um, um, examine further how this COVID-19 and the, you know, um, 
pandemic affected our students in the cultural learning further. Next slide, please. So in, in terms of, um, in terms of, I just want to go back uh, to the previous slide and then mention that where most of the learning occurred in terms of, you know, um, orientation is that we are seeing significant growth in um, polarization, minimization, and a few students were able to move up to acceptance, as you can see. And um, we didn't have any students um, move up to you know, adaptation, um, orientation. And the one, the two students in denial, one student still gained a few points. Um, I think about six points. Even you know, so that student is still you know slowly moving along the denial orientation. And the other one student in denial is one student that had a significant regression. So again, give you a sense of where our uh, where students are growing. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. So looking at I, you know, in a cultural competence, where students are growing, how they are growing. Uh, what we saw just using the, again, the value rubric, we are seeing, you know, significant growth in students' curiosity, in a cultural empathy, openness, and self-awareness and worldview frameworks. Particularly when it comes to intercultural empathy and openness and self-awareness, the growth was, you know, uh, tremendous. And which shows that our students are growing in all across all dimensions of you know intercultural knowledge, attitudes, and skills. And later on, I will share some examples to give you a, you know, a sense of you know how we are assessing the you know growth in empathy, openness, and awareness. And what we also notice that is when it comes to the behavioral aspect, our students are still uh, you know in need of more ex you know exposure and experience with diversity. As such, their intercultural communication skills and practices still need, you know, uh, it takes more time for them to develop. It wasn't something that they could gain immediately after three courses of, you know, related three courses on intercultural learning modules. So here is a quick uh, glimpse into what developing, you know, in a, intercultural empathy look like in our students. And this is a response. Um, this is a one student said uh, during an interview uh, in the second semester, uh, when asked about well, you know um, learning Italian, what does um, how this student is making sense of learning Italian? And this student responded that it makes you realize how much effort other people have to put into coming to speak in you know English in America. So really, the student is re you know taking that perspective and put it into. Um, you know, the perspectives of others and making that connections. All right, and this is also another example of a student sharing um, empathy and showing uh, empathy and self-awareness. And this is a white male student uh, who shared uh, this paragraph through an assignment um, in 1103. So you can see that I, I will read it out loud because of the ASL interpreter. Uh, what has been challenging is finally being the person that feels like the odd person out in a situation. I'm a white man in America. I have never been oppressed. And it, as I, the average life in America has de was designed for me, I always understand everything that's going on. And that's a great privilege, but it was really eye-opening to see that, to see what it was like to, to not be the person who understands what's going on. It was a first-hand insight into how other people feel when they come here. And it was on an extremely small scale as well. So as you can see, the student is really describing um, the learning experience as well as you know, the intercultural learning content that was you know, integrated into the curriculum. Also using that experience to evaluate the learning, um, the impact of the learning um, has on his perception as well as perspectives and uh, able to integrate that learning into his um, lives and then connect it to other people um, that he had very little you know, um, uh, knowledge of before. So a few 
quick notes on our future research. As you know, April mentioned, we are continuing the research in the, uh, into the second phase uh, where we want to really focus on the instructor's capacity for intercultural learning and training and what kind of impact in, in, uh, instructor's capacity has on students' learning. As uh, we noted earlier that we something that we learned throughout um, the, uh, the first phase is that instructors um, are lacking in that capability. And then you know, we also gave instructors the IDI training before um, 1101 started in 2019. And we realized that instructors are uh, sometimes um, at the same level as the students, or maybe you know, they needed more developmental work on their own. Um, also, we are looking into intercultural learning and um, the relationship between intercultural learning and students' academic success um, in general. Um, particularly, we're interested in how intercultural learning and the development of intercultural competence contributes to students' sense of belonging, self-efficacy, and you know, other you know, um, more um, traditional academic success outcomes as well. Also, um, we are expanding um, our study to include other languages as well. So uh, we are very fortunate that German uh, has agreed to, you know, uh, come on board. So very grateful for that, you know, collaboration. And then we and French and French. Yes, thanks for correcting me. I see Winnie's right here. So that's a good reminder. Um, and also, we are looking into the possibility of, you know, collaborating with other institutions who are, you know, um, interested in um, trying something, you know, similar with us as well. So, and then also looking at the intersections of intercultural learning, diversity, equity, and you know, inclusion efforts. Um, what are the connections there? How do we move students? What kind of impact does it make in terms of, you know, uh, the overall goals of diversity and equity and inclusion? Thank you. And um, finally, just a few final thoughts that I want to leave you with before we move into the questions is that we need to start with ourselves as, as educators, developing our own intercultural competence. Um, our research team, you know, when Janice and I started, you know, contemplating on the research project, we really started um, by engaging in the intercultural development, um, you know, on our on our own. And then both Janice and I, we took the IDI and we talked about, you know, what does it mean, you know, where we are. And it was, it was a really uh, personally beneficial experience for us. Um, I think I'm speaking for Janice and April as well. And we also started by um, having all research team members, both graduate students, instructors, and um, the research assistants taking the IDI and going through the debriefs, uh, you know, about their own experiences. And it made it much you know, easier for everybody on the team to connect with the data and uh, interpret the, you know, uh, the interviews and interpret the results in a way that you know, uh, we, it enabled us to get on the same page much quickly, what it means, what the students are talking about. And our instructors went through the you know, IDI, as I mentioned, and it, what we learned is that throughout the you know, uh, two-year process, you know, intercultural learning is a continuous learning process that requires reflection, practice, and intentional goal setting. So it doesn't stop with one training, one workshop, or one module. You have to engage in you know, throughout the process. And quite honestly, as a research team, we often talk about how much you know we are benefiting as an individual from this research project and also from the perspectives that students bringing in and also that we learned that the development ap approach is critical in guiding through um, guiding students through the intercultural learning journey is that um, we need to meet students at where they are and guide them through um, as they experience the discomfort you know, in the learning process. That notion of pushing students out of their comfort zone and then moving them through the learning process is, um, is you know, is the most important aspect. We, what, what we see um, early on is that as by taking, giving the uh, baseline IDI to students, we were able to see, oh, as a group, 
where our class is. That means we need to make adjustments. We can't just dump the contents, hoping that they will digest it. And you know, knowing where they are developmentally gave us a good, you know, um, sort of, you know, reality check and, you know, enabled, you know, helped us to adjust the contents quite frequently, um, quite frequently, quite frequently throughout the process. Also thinking about, you know, how do we move from, you know, that sense of, you know, let's just all get along, you know, you know, you know, teaching the tolerance, teaching the, you know, respect the differences to a curriculum that is more oriented in equity and social justice. I think there is a lot of, you know, room for us to uh, think about this. All right, I think we still have uh, a few minutes for questions. Well, I'd like to begin with one that came in through the chat, if I could. Um, it, it's they, the person said it would be helpful to give some examples. Oh, wait, sorry. How did you measure student growth? How did you determine where they were on the inventory and what data was used to develop these conclusions? You need to explain, I think, a little better about the, the data collection, maybe. Thank you. Um, so I think I rushed it through that part a little bit, so my apologies. So uh, how we measure the gains in an cultural competence um, Quantitatively, we used IDI. We gave the students, you know, IDI, um, which is a, you know, a survey consists of uh, 50 questions. Um, students took the IDI twice, and then we were able to compare their scores before and after um, the intervention and see the gains. And then we also did statistical analysis, um, pair t-test to see if that, you know, difference is you know, significant or um, happening by chance. And indeed, the, it is, you know, we got, you know, very good positive results on that one. And then we also assessed students um, in their assignments um, and then in their final exams. Essentially, we asked very similar questions, for example, in the final exams or assignments at 1101. And then we sort of, you know, repeated the questions at 1103. And so we are really comparing students uh, throughout the process. And the the data we I shared today is really, you know, uh, from the students, 33 students out of over 100 students that we followed in the three semesters. Uh, the next question is, it would be helpful, wait, it would be helpful to give some examples of these two categories. I'm not, I'm not completely sure which categories they mean, but also this person says, could you give us some concrete examples of teaching intercultural competence in the classroom? Um, I, I can respond to the second question in that um, we have two webinars in the fall series that go through all of these examples and we, we it, it's so detailed that it wouldn't be possible to do it justice here. Um, I'm not sure what the, what the two categories mean. Maybe Cindy, you know, or maybe Fulvia could explain, Fulvia Musti. And I, give, I think I can speak to both Sarah and Fulvia's question that how does IDI measure it? You can look at the, um, I can share with you um, the website, which, you know, really provides lots of information and the statistical. Alitha did. Yeah, thanks, Alitha. Thank Hi. you. Results Hi. on how IDI measures in the cultural competence and places students in different um, orientations. And then the reflective, uh, the qualitative data we had in, you know, the three interviews and uh, reflection, it's all coded by, um, according to the value rubric, rubric that I mentioned earlier, um, which gives you a really nice rubric on, four, you know, the four developmental stages um, of intercultural competence. There's a question about, is all the reflection or writing done in the L1? Um, so for the most part, what happens is in the classroom, we take it as far as we can in the target language. And then at some point, the conversation will switch to English. And I, I know that the table I showed you suggested that there was a lot of work going on in English. It actually wasn't. Um, I would say over three semesters, what, maybe five class periods over three semesters might have been de dedicated fully in terms of time, 55 minutes um, to these kind of discussions. The reflection writing was done for the most part in the L1 because that's the way to get to the deepest 
uh, place for students there. I do know that in 103, there was a question in Italian um, regarding behavior in a certain situation. They were, we were able to let them answer in Italian. Yeah, I'll jump in to say that we, when we're thinking about what we do in the target language and what we do in English, um, there's a difference between activities, right, and um, assignments that they can do that are a part of our modules um, that they can do in the target language. Like um, my students currently have um, some of the same activities from this study, and um, there are things that they turn in that are in Italian. It's specifically this structured reflection, which we consider to be um, private and critical and transformative that is done in English. And I don't anticipate us change, changing our mind, particularly at the elementary level. That There would be no reason to put a student in such a difficult situation of trying to express these sorts of things with language that they don't have. But um, we are experimenting with our majors and minors doing like some really good reflective work in the target language. Um, but it's really a between assignment activities and reflection that we have to draw the line in um, at the elementary level. And I also wanna say that the, um, the activities is particularly the talk abroad assignments, um, that work has been incorporated into the textbook uh, now through video interviews with Italians. So we are going to enhance our IDI work, I mean, our intercultural competence work in future by having those activities be already done with the course. And then we could do more talk abroad on um, yet other intercultural competence uh, talks. As far as what did we cut out in the content of the program, I think there was maybe one grammar point that I felt was useless anyway, um, that I was like, okay, we don't need to do this. Well, um, well, we tested students on it though. We did not make cuts to our test. So it was really about whether it was a grammar point that needed communicative practice in the classroom. And it wasn't a grammar point that was in the fourth edition of Avanti needed communicative practice in the classroom. So that was the one that got offloaded to asynchronous work, but it was still tested. So in that way, I don't think that we did get something out, but sorry, Janice, keep going. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I do wanna jump in and say that a lot of the uh, work, uh, if you are thinking about workload, how much is it gonna take um, to you know, start something like this is really that the, uh, in the front end, Janice and April put a lot of thinking and we did a lot of brainstorming session. So once that planning done in, in terms of implementation wise, it was a, you know, we started with, you know, instructors giving them a you know, quick, I think it was during their, uh, one of their staff meetings at, in the early fall, three hour training that we gave them IDI and then gave them a brief, you know, um, reflection debriefing session and then um, that was it. And then, you know, everything else was always, all, you know, all incorporated into the assignments and exams. So minor changes here and there. And that was one of the goals is that we don't want to disrupt the existing language curriculum and instruction hours too much. And so that, you know, um, making sure that instructors are not um, teaching something they are not prepared at all. And also um, the... Go ahead. Um, in response to some of the questions regarding intercultural um, learning modules and activities, um, I think Purdue has, um, you know, really good collection of, you know, all the intercultural learning materials and their open um, access website. So Alyssa, go ahead and promote yourself there um, in the chat, please. Um, and then also, uh, I want to, you know, um, you know, reiterate that and when it comes to intercultural learning, it's really not about what you teach. It's really about the pedagogy and how you facilitate the discussions uh, with students. The idea is really helping students connect intercultural learning concept to, you know, their own experience. Because a lot of students, as we were interviewing 20 something students, it was so, you know, enlightening that students will share their background and um, you know their take on uh, the learning material, and some of the students are you know as soon as you know 
um, the first interview, and this is a couple of weeks into the you know fall semester, they just started getting to know this material. They're saying, uh, I'm, a, I'm having an aha moment here, Cindy. I really know now get it, what it means. This is something that I've been thinking about throughout my life, you know, as an immigrant, um, you know, um, in this country or, you know, as, you know, as an only Democrat in a rural Ohio in a small town, this makes sense to me. So that ability for students really connect the intercultural learning and intercultural competence to their own personal connection. I think that is the gem of this curriculum. I want to, I can address one that Maria in the chat also asked, um, how do we help students to write their reflections and the questions to consider? So I think because we were focused on offering the data that this is a deliverable, we, well, um, we also didn't go into depth in this, but in the fall webinar series, um, there are multiple activities that are followed by complete reflections. So Janice only gave one example of a reflection prompt, but in fact, um, generally our reflection prompts um, include a few questions to consider and um, some more language to help with that communication of expectations um, about writing. And I've also developed, I think as, as you begin this journey and you start preparing students, you have your discussion in class and the way in which you finish your discussion in class absolutely prepares students for the type of reflection that they're going to take. So they're going to make. So there's that interpersonal part of, part of it as well. But um, we can put the webinar, fall webinar series link in the chat again too. Mm -hmm. I think there's a question about IDI and you know about the cost and why. I just want to explain a little on why we decided to use um, IDI. There are a number of instruments um, assessing intercultural competence or effectiveness. Um, and um, through our research, we really found that IDI um, you know, spoke to our goals of facilitating that um, self-learning process for students because it's an assessment tool as we used in the study, but it also is um, assessment guided, you know, develop, developmental tool in a way that students are able to use the IDI um, to uh, set the goals. And there's also a very nice intercultural development plan comes with the you know, IDI that is, you know, sort of generated for indiv students individually. So students can use that as a sort of a learning guide to continue their process and um, we uh, there is a there is a cost involved in it and you can uh, look at the cost information on the idi website and we were able to uh, afford it uh, with the grants and the funding from various departments that i mentioned earlier and also one of the new features is that they um idi provides an online briefing modules right now which uh, is very um it's a huge, you know, um, in terms of rolling it out to a larger number of um, students. With our study, Janice and I, we interviewed all the students, and but we were not able to give debriefing to all everyone enrolled in the class as we, you know, um, had hoped. So I think this is going to be, you know, hugely beneficial to students going forward. There's a question about um, sharing examples of um, ICC uh, modules in the syllabus. I think that it, the information is uh, covered in the uh, full webinar series. Um, we can put- Well, I think in terms of the syllabus, if you, if, if you wanna go back to that, that original slide that I showed, I showed how each course had certain tasks that were assigned to them and um, those were distributed throughout the course um, in logical locations that had to do with whatever the chapter content was, for example. Um, so it's not something that I can give you a recipe for anyone's course. It was just how it was logically based on the content of our course. Um, so for example, the talk abroad on stereotyping, uh, this one in 101 was in chapter two about adjectives. And we had a special activity created 
uh, about that, which I believe is in the fall webinar series. Um, and these uh, cognitive dissonance photo discussions, they're very, very brief. Um, these are like warm up activities at the beginning of a class. Um, and then the, the introduction is based on, well, it certainly will be in the future, on the material presented in the webinar from Jupa Lahiri, um, a series of videos that we have adapted that, that are going to be used for introducing the value of learning world languages and intercultural competence as what we're doing in our program. I just Actually, I'll put, the link in the, the, oh, go I'll, ahead. Put, I'll put the link in there up front to the Joompa mat material. Uh, grading expectations, etc. Um, I think this is a good moment for me to go to the end of the, um, bear with me, please, everyone. Um, uh, we're getting close. And um, grading and expectations, I, I hear you, Fulvia, um, and the, our rubrics and um, like this, this sort of administrative setup, um, we can definitely talk more about that. Absolutely. And, and we can just email about that, but it certainly bears talking about. I was going to say that I really liked the idea of using can-do statements to gauge process. And I am thinking about that in self-assessment, particularly because I think we've learned through COVID that our learning management systems, at least in the case of Canvas, allows us to do non-graded surveys. Um, and I have recently been very excited about the idea that students could asynchronously outside of class self-assess with can-do statements. Um, in regards to intercultural competence, but also just in regards to language learning in general. So. And I think we can tell everyone goodbye, almost. We have another minute. Does anyone mm -hmm. want to keep us over? Well, thanks everybody for coming. I know, I know how challenging it is, especially when the weather's getting nicer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And this will be available to come back to if you need to find anything. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. All right, and we were on time. How did we do that? That's weird. <laughs> I think you can uh, stop recording now. Yeah, I'm going to do it. it Sujin can clean me up. Can you uh, stop sharing?